Hi, Koji. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I am good. I'm good. It's a beautiful day today here in Los Angeles. Good. It's I'm in Northwest Arkansas and it's gorgeous here too. I think it's only like 75 and sunny and nice. It's like 90 here, but it's not 100, so I'm, I'm thankful. Right, right. We've had over 90 degree weather lately, so I'm very happy for the reprieve. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you for doing this with us. Uh, this is part of our new series, World Smiths, um, where we interview our creators. Um, we chat with them about, you know, maybe a specific topic about a new release coming out and uh, some of the other stuff we do. So I appreciate you taking the time out to be with us. Um, you have a new comic coming out and it is, and um, will you say it so I can make sure I say it correctly? Yeah, Yasuke. Yasuke. Yeah. Okay, Yasuke. So Yasuke, the African Samurai. And this is historically based because um, there was an actual African who went to Japan and was a samurai. And um, so it required some research and it also required some interesting uh, perspective being someone of Japanese descent and considering someone who looks very different um, in this new culture. So um, I thought maybe we would talk about that a little bit. And um, Outland Entertainment is, is very focused right now um, on making sure that we have diversity in our characters um, which means it's important to us also to have diversity in our creators. Um, and we want our characters to be written from the perspective of um, the people that they represent. Um, so uh, that's a little unusual with you because as I mentioned, you're of Japanese descent, but you're writing about a black character. So um, we wanted to make sure that we delved into that because we feel like we are, we feel like we're honoring both cultures um, in a great way. and. Um, I would just like to hear more from your perspective on both sides of that. Um, yeah, so, so, so go, uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, um, yeah, I, I think that there, there's always trepidation when you're writing about a character from a different ethnicity or different race. Um, so I, I was definitely aware of that walking into the project, um, but I did feel like I had a good handle on it uh, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, like you said, being of Japanese descent, I feel like I have the perspective of all the other characters in the story are Japanese. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I think that's that I could really relate to in the Yasuke character is of being a foreigner, being someone who looks different and thinks differently than everyone in this country. I mean, um, so as you mentioned, it's a, it's a guy, he came over to Japan as a slave and it ended up becoming a, uh, a samurai. And it's really a story about a fish, a fish out of water. And, um, and as you know, as being Asian American in America, I definitely know what it feels like to be a fish out of water. You know, um, one of the jokes I always tell people is that no matter how long, or that's not a joke, but it's kind of a comment um, for Asian Americans, no matter how long we're here, we're always seen as a perpetual foreigner. You know, um, mm -hmm. my, my grandpa, my great grandfather, he came to America until like in the 1880s, you know, and yet I'm seen as the not an American. Um, and that's ironic, considering even like somebody like former President Donald Trump was his his you know his family has been here less than me. And then if you put us in a room, he would be the American, and I would be the guy from Asia, probably China. So you know, I think there's a lot of like uh, I could relate to Yasuke character in terms of being you know being looked at depending on what part of the country I'm at, you know, being uh, being considered different and and all those. So I could I really uh, I really uh, personalize that that feeling of a person and was able to put it in my character. That's, that's really cool. That's cool that you even get to do that through your art. Like, yay, I'm excited <laughs> for that. And um, also, I, I think having a Japanese perspective is, is important in this project. Um, I think, as we mentioned um, previously in a talk before, was that one of the challenges with a lot of the other projects around this story is that they're seeing it from a very American perspective. Mm -hmm. um, specifically looking at skin color and race and and race is especially an issue in America because of all the history and you know everything that's gone on in this country but in Japan it's very different and I think the problem with people from America writing stories about Japan is they they miss the 
they missed that whole storyline, you know, of race. So, for example, what I was telling you was that Yasuke, no one hated him because of his black skin in Japan in the 16th century because he was literally the one of, if not the first African in Japan. If anything, he was a curiosity. Um, the whole hating people of dark skin came as the country became more westernized. Not, but not in the 16th century, it didn't make sense. And in fact, if they didn't like anybody, they didn't like the Europeans because the Europeans were trying to convert them to Catholicism or, or religion, uh, Christianity. Um, and they were also, you know, not taking baths. And Japanese people, if anything, are very, very clean people and taking a bath and, you know, and washing themselves all the time was something that was really important to the Japanese, and still is very important to the Japanese. And so when these people came and they're smelly and trying to convert them, those are two things that they didn't like. And so, you know, so this whole, the whole feeling of Yasuke is different when it's from that perspective of like, it's not about race, it's about something else. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's really interesting because I, you had mentioned before that this was the first black person they'd ever seen, like ever, ever. And so he was uh, uh, just a new thing. And I can imagine he was taller, significantly taller, and um you know some of the the characteristics we think of like if you really think about both races um you know the darker skin the different colors of skin and even some of your physical features and your height um like to, i i have to imagine that because for the most part i walk into a place and other people look like me so um i it like i said it's really cool that you get to show that experience through your art um, now you mentioned you mentioned that a lot of the interpretations of this uh, character in, in the time are through a westernized lens. Lens, and in previous conversations, um, Koji and I are like BFFs, by the way, for everybody watching. Uh, not really. We've only known each other a few months, but we just keep running into each other yeah. online intentionally. Um, so, but you had mentioned that you love Romeo and Juliet. Um, and you look at it from a Japanese perspective because there are there are qualities in it that, um, or an Asian perspective, I think is how you said it before. There are qualities in it um, that that just are you read it differently than I do. So, um, do you do you want to kind of touch on that for a second, just because I think that's super interesting? Yeah, yeah, I think that there to me, um, having been born in America and being fourth generation Japanese American. When I look at the Western culture, which I'm a part of, so, uh, but when I look at the Western culture, there are two books that I think are two two works of literary art that I think really encapsulates American and Western civilization, and one of them being Romeo and Juliet. And the reason I do is that it's 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 how they conceive of love, um, and this kind of this this you know um, this super romantic, um, all encompassing, fatal love is is the ideal of love. In America, in the West, um, even if they end up killing themselves, it's still seen as like this ultimate love story. And in Asia, or I should speak of Japan, Japan specifically, because I'm Japanese, but like it, it doesn't. That doesn't really make sense, you know. <laughs> like that kind of love story doesn't make sense to somebody outside of of this culture. And uh, for me, it's meant a lot because having grown up in this culture, I did see it as the ultimate love story when I was like 14 or 13 when I read it. And then as I've grown up and as I've changed and gotten my heart broken and got married and had kids and all that, my perspective has changed a lot. And specifically like looking at it from a different cultural perspective has really helped me understand that story in ways I think is, is, is very, very different. And I do think it's helpful to see kind of the, the pitfalls of that kind of love, but also understanding it and how it affects our views of, of that kind of relationship. So, so likewise, you said that looking at the um, this story that you've created um, or adapted, what you mentioned that looking at it from the, the Japanese lens is different. Like, what is it about your telling of this story that you feel like um, is a little different? Yeah. So first, first, as I as I said, it's it's less about race and less mm -hmm. about skin color. Um, it just so happened that he was this African guy in this really uh, time in Japanese history. But I think my take is different in that he is our lens into this really, really fascinating time in Japanese history. So before this, for the first thousand years before this story takes place, 
Japan was basically at civil in a civil war. They were killing each other. These units were killing each other every day, every year, all the time. It was constant war. And he comes at the kind of the not the tail end, but the last like 20, 30 years. He he comes in kind of right when one person, this guy named Nobunaga, he's a Japanese warlord, when he starts to um starts to bring oh forcibly bring the people together, um, mostly by killing people, but he brings, he starts uniting the country. And he's the first of three people that kind of unite the country. And the only way you can unite, unite a bloody civil war country is by killing a whole bunch of people. So to me, what my perspective is, is different is that he's our access into this really, really interesting time. Hmm. Um, and so we're seeing, or what, what, what makes my story different is we're seeing this relationship between this really terrible warlord, but who's really progressive, but really terrible, and this African guy. And how, like, and they're drastically different in age, they're drastically different in responsibility and experience, but they have this weird friendship. And to me, that is what makes this really interesting. And I should mention that Nobunaga, everyone in his life was trying to kill him, from his wife, all his generals to every guy that was in his army or everybody outside his army was trying to kill him. And the only guy that didn't have really, who wasn't trying to kill him was the guy he, he made into a samurai, which is this African guy, Yasuke. And so I think that they kind of created this, this friendship. And, and what I really want to, to capture is that friendship between this warlord and this guy. And uh, that was one of the things that gave me trepidation in the beginning about the story was I thought Yasuke was more like a pet at first. Mm. And then as the more research I did, the more I realized that these two, I believe, had a good had a friendship, had a mm. had a relationship. He would play with his children, he would he was invited to dinner, you know, with him and his family. And so he actually had a relationship. And and I believe he was there at the end when he had to kill himself when he, uh, there was a coup against Nomonaga's life. And I believe he was one of the last people, if not the last person with him. So I think that's um. what really made me like really like this story. So what I tell people about this story is that it's like if I told a story about George Washington and I focused on a random guy in his house, like that wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. You're missing the most important part of the story, which is George Washington. So, mm -hmm. you know, to me, this is what Yasuke's story is about. He's our access to this world. And he's, he's a curiosity because he's a really interesting guy, but he's not the most interesting guy in the room. Um, let me tell you one story about Nobunaga that I find really fascinating. So there was this uh, Buddhist temple that was... Uh, fighting him for, you know, years and wouldn't, wouldn't uh, capitulate to him. And so he, he went in there and they finally gave up and then he killed everyone. And I think he killed like 3000 people, men, women, children. And that's the kind of guy he was. And that's the kind of guy he, anybody, he was friends with this one random dude. <laughs> and that to me yeah. is really fascinating, you know, that kind of relationship. So, so you seem interested in it. Well, I mean, obviously, you're more interested in, in the grand scope of this Japanese history, this at least this era of Japanese history. Um, are you planning on to do more creation, uh, story creation in, in this time period or, or in this, not even, I mean, it goes past time, but, you know, this uh, just Japanese history, I guess, in general? Yeah, actually, so, you know, when I, fir I first heard about Yasuke's story on Facebook, um, one of my friends posted something and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know. And then I, I didn't think it was a real story. And then I did some research and I found out it was a real story. But as I as I started doing research into him, I started realizing this was a super interesting time in Japanese history. So just to give a little bit more context to the story, after Nobunaga dies, there's another guy that comes in, he gets killed pretty quickly. And then there's a third guy, Tokugawa, and he ends up being, his family ends up being in control for the next 200 years. Mm. And so within this retinue of, of people, if everyone who's going to control Japan for the next 200 and something years um, within this plan, within his generals. And so it's just a really interesting time. So I, I think that uh, I'm, not, I'm not really exploring other work in it. I mean, Yasuke is really my access point to getting people to see how interesting this time is. Because frankly, when people think of samurai, they're, they're actually thinking about this time period. Um, they don't realize mm -hmm. it, but they're thinking about this time period. Most people think of like the last samurai, which took place in like 1860s. But by then they were just, they weren't warriors anymore. They were just mm -hmm. landowners, like in the same way knights were, like they stopped mm -hmm. fighting after a while, right? They had other people fighting for them. But in the 16th century, they were, the the samurai were literally out there killing people. And that's what, the, that's what this story takes place in. 
Cool. So um, your, your profession is actually more focused in the uh, film industry. Uh, you live in LA, you're a writer, screenwriter, you're a director and producer. Not a director, producer only. Not a director, producer yeah. only. Okay, um, my apologies. No, it's okay. Um, Um, so being in the film industry and being Asian American, of course, that is of concern for you. And so you're involved in a lot of organizations that, um, are concerned with Asians in film. Um, so, so you have a sensitivity, sensitivity to the depiction. Um, and then at, at the same time, and I'm hoping these come together as I'm speaking, um, at the same time, if, as we've discussed before, there's, um, there's tensions uh, between some minority groups. Um, and of course, specifically, we're looking at Asian and, and African minority groups in America. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I, and I bring that up because from a, a white middle, Midwestern, fairly rural uh, uh, community, like, it, it's difficult for me to realize that not all minorities are just like friends. Um, so, um, are, are the, is there anything in particular that you were very concerned about? You did mention you didn't want him um, to be represented as like a pet, um, but is there anything in, else in particular that you were very concerned about? And, and what did you do to make sure that you were representing um, a black person well? Yeah, um, good question. So one of the challenges with this story, Yasuke, is that there's only three mentions of him in history. In a, in a Jesuit, like priest, like a uh, diary. So there's three mentions of him. So there's not a lot about him. And then once Nobunaga, the warlord dies, there's zero mentions of him after that. So we're not 100% mm -hmm. sure of what happened. Um, so I did spend a lot of time looking at, you know, some of the places that he could have been before he got enslaved. So like Mozambique was one of the places and looking at a lot of the cultures there and trying to get a sense of it. Not that I was going to have any store too much of a story there, but wanting to really understand where he was from and what the geopolitical situation was, you know, in terms of slavery, in terms of the colonizers in those countries, like the, I think it was the Dutch, um, but I could be wrong. Um, but something, you know, just looking at, trying to understand the history of it. Um, and then I did reach out to scholars of African history to talk to them about kind of that migration or migration, I should say, slavery yeah. um, of people and kind of trying to understand what it was like. And, you know, one of the stories about Yasuke, he was a very unusual man with that he, you know, um, the, the, the rumors are that he was really well read and he could speak Japanese. Um, and so, you know, it makes him a very unusual man. So the problem was I, there's not so much, there's not, no, there's no history with him. So I kind of had to create this whole history and this whole mm. story of his, that, that is, there's more than just the three times that we hear about him in, in this, in, you know, in this writing. So I, th I think the challenge, you know, and it's something that I'm, I'm very sensitive about. Ultimately, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a film and TV guy. So my goal is to, you know, if this ever were to become a TV show, Let's definitely hire people who better represented him in for mm -hmm. the show to make sure that there were African Americans or African folks who were part of the writer's room or who played major roles, not just being a part, but actually played major roles and making sure that his voice was was 100% accurate, just like I would hope that they would have Japanese Americans or even myself involved in it as well, just to make sure that the Japanese voice was, was rep well represented as well. Yeah, because I could see it would be really important to make sure that you're historically accurate, but also that the modern presentation of it is sensitive to modern concerns as well, like, yeah. and, and making sure that those both are covered, that could be a challenge. And so, yeah, yeah. you want to keep pe people on your staff that are going to be like, hey, this, this, is, this isn't going to work. And, um, and nowadays, frankly, in Hollywood, that's uh, for TV, especially that's that's the way it is now. You do, you need to have people who look like the characters that are on the show. Um, it's not as much like that in film because writing mm -hmm. is different in film than it is for TV. But for definitely for TV, I mean, for this to go anywhere, it would definitely have to have African Americans or African uh, as part of this as part of the the writer team. If not if not even the main 
showrunner. Um, so that is a conversation that that we've been having is that should we get an African American showrunner who and a showrunner is a person who like leads the show, the main writer and the main director and the main producer. And um, and that could be like that is a path that I definitely want to explore is that 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 voice becomes even more clear and present and my voice becomes kind of in the background a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. So in in the the writing world and and what Outland is striving to do, I mean, I, I mentioned before we want to make sure that we have you know authentic voices and we have people who are sensitive. If I mean, we want diversity in our publications, which means you know if we only have one creator and they want to create diversity in their publication, like they're whether they're a minority or not, they're going to have to write from different perspectives. And so our kind of equivalent to that probably is having sensitivity readers um, and Outland has already started hiring. And, and by the way, we're, you know, we would love if anybody knows any sensitivity readers, have them contact us so we can put them on their, our list. But, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're representing that diversity and the, the individuals in that diversity in yeah. the correct way. So, um, which is fantastic, fantastic that the story is being held by people who have a stake in the story. Yeah. Um, and I know it's it's a controversial thing. Um, I teach, as you know, I teach screenwriting classes and I've gotten a lot of discussions with my students about this and about how there has to be authenticity in the voice. You know, so if a student is trying to write, say they're Caucasian, they're trying to write an African-American story. I mean, one of the first things they say is it's gonna be a tough road to go down because, you know, who's gonna buy it from you? And then their mm -hmm. comment to me is always like, well, that's not fair. And I understand that because if I could only write Asian stories, my career would be very short and I wouldn't be able to write anything. Um, so I get it, but I also get the other side where I'm tired of other people writing my story. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's, it's a difficult, like there's, it's a difficult road and it's not clear, you know, you can't just say only Asian people should write Asian stories because then, man, my career is gonna be terrible. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, so, so what I tell people is I think that there's, I think you have to be sensitive, right? Like you're talking about, there's, there's a sensitivity. And then I think that we're all human, you know? And I think that there, you have to find ways to connect to the character. Um, can I tell you a quick story about what I always think about when I when I think about this? So, you know, I was reading in, a, I think it was in a journal where they said that human society or human, human beings in general got down to about 10,000 individuals at one point in our history. Um, because of ice age and everything else, we were just die we died off. We almost completely went extinct. And I only bring that up now because that means that every single human being that's on the planet now came from those 10,000 individuals. Wow. And that means that we're very like, ge ge uh, you know, uh, genetically, we're very, very similar people. Like mm -hmm. we, we, could, we could all mate, you know, whether you're African-American and Asian, they could mate or African-American and Caucasians, they could mate or Latino or whatever, right? We could all mate. And that means we're genetically the same. And so, you know, I, I think that I always try to remember that we're all much, much more similar than we are different, but we try to focus on that difference. Mm -hmm. And to bring and to bring it back to Yasuke, you know, one of the ways that I could write it is that I look at it from the idea that he's this, he's this foreigner in this really foreign land and him and how he, how he reacts and changes to her because he's, he's kind of in a precarious position, right? He goes from slavery and then he goes into this warlord's house and he's kind of caught between these two, you know, really big organizations, the Catholic church on one hand, and then also this warlord on the other hand, and how does he navigate that in this foreign land? You know, um, I relate to this idea of being the foreigner, like we talked about. So I, that's how I come into the story. And I think that a lot, too many writers, they don't, they don't try to make the person human whether mm -hmm. they're writing, when they're writing outside themselves. And I think what ends up happening, that's when you have two dimensional characters, like the Asian guy who could only, he's a computer nerd and the African-American guy who's a sports star, you know? Um, like, I think that's when the problems start to happen is when you start to see them, it's just this idea of who they are as opposed to making them three dimensional and interesting characters. Mm -hmm. So you put a lot of research into it, which is really cool. Um, and, at some point, I mean, I'm sure you wanted to do a lot of research up front, um, and at some point you had to decide to start writing it. 
did you continue doing research? Did you have to change stuff? Like what, what was the process of going from, okay, I found out about this real life person that existed at one point. It's a really interesting situation, starting to research and then actually getting into the writing part of it. Um, yeah, so I spent a couple months just reading book about samurais and reading books about that time period. Um, and what's really interesting about this feature as opposed to other things I've done is that it had very little to do with my main character because, because my main character, like I said, is only mentioned three times in history. Um, so really trying to find out who these other players are in in this in his world. So like the the warlord and all the people in his retinue and seeing who they were and what happened to them and really understanding Japanese history and getting a better sense of Japanese history. Um, before, before I started this project, I didn't know that much, you know, and I think I spent way too much time <laughs> doing research on this project. Um, so I feel like somewhat of an expert in, in quotes um, on the subject um, because I spent a lot of time reading books, watching documentaries, and really finding out um, stuff. And actually, now if anyone's interested, there is a there's a documentary on Netflix, the documentary series called "The Age of the Samurai," and it basically covers everything I researched. <laughs> I wish I'd, I wish they existed when I was doing research, but it's basically all there. They tell the story of like how Japan got united uh, under these kind of these these warlords and how they kind of took over, and and that's basically what I did. Cool. So um, is there anything else that you want to discuss about this, the comic that's coming out? And, and at the time of this filming, it's not um, available on Kickstarter, but it will be on Kickstarter soon. So it is a crowdfunded uh, publication and then it'll be available on our website. Um, but is there anything else you want to talk about with maybe with working with artists or, or sure. a certain panel or anything like that? Yeah, so let me talk about two things. One, one is first is that I did do this thing called Kendo, which is Japanese sword fighting for 20 something years, um, which is uh, this uh, is basically you hit each other with sticks, kind of like it's Japanese fencing <laughs> is basically yeah. what it is. And I did it for a really long time. I did it till all the way to 18. Um, they don't have belts like karate or something, but I was the equivalent of a teacher. Um, so I did it for an incredibly long time. So sword fighting is something that I, I've done a lot of. Um, I'm not sure I want to actually fight people with swords, but I do know I'm familiar with the the concept of, of sword fighting. Um, and, and I should mention kendo is kind of the art that came down from the samurai. So there's like a, like, it makes sense why I, I'm the one that I believe should be writing this project from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is uh, the artist that I'm working with is, is this gentleman named Jamie Noguchi, and he's super, super talented. Um, he's this guy that I met uh, while working at the Japanese American National Museum. He lives on the East Coast. Um, so we were, he, he really, he being, a, uh, he's Hapa, so he's mixed Asian. And he, I think, really understands, he, he's, he, you know, just as much as an Asian American, as like a full Asian American, understands this idea of being a perpetual foreigner as well. And uh, the idea of people kind of putting themselves into them, right? Because when, when you have a person who hop in, they're always like, who are you? What are you? Like, as mm -hmm. though, like, you're just your race or your races, right? Whatever you have. So he, he was, he's an, he's an amazing artist. So we, we teamed up and he was able to really capture that story in a way that I think is, is really, really amazing. Great, great, thanks. So I um, wanted to mention all the other stuff that you do too. We already talked about how you work in film um, and feel free to talk about any of the projects that are upcoming. You also have a few podcasts. Yes. Um, so talk about those and um, yeah, anything else you're working on, just sure. plug away. I have a, um, a movie coming out, I believe in August through Paramount. It's called The Commando. It stars Mickey Rourke and Michael Jai White. So it's a it's an action film that I, I don't know where it's going to come out or how it's going to come out. I'm not really involved in that, but I am the writer producer. So, you know, when it does come out, check it out. Hopefully, you like it. Um, and then the other thing is, I am um, I do have a podcast as Sarah mentioned called the Unofficial Official Story, where we look at or and I should mention sorry that um, I have it with my co-host Dwayne Perkins, who's a comedian, and Jennifer Field, who is an actor. And what we do is we take a look at paranormal, true crime, conspiracies, and just anything weird like UFOs. And we tell you what happened, what people believe happened. And then we each make up our own stories to tell you what really happened. And we're really excited because so far we're 
we're almost four episodes in and we've had some wonderful guests and wonderful topics. So we've covered things like a vampire from New Hampshire in the 19th century. We've covered an alleged meeting with Eisenhower and some Nordic aliens. We've covered uh, did 5G cause the coronavirus and most recent, our most recent episodes with this uh, comedian named uh, Mandy Sklar, who does a podcast called Dumb People Town, where we asked the question, did Babe Ruth really call a shot in the 1933 World Series? So it's really fun and we have a great time doing it. And then you've got the guide code. Yes. So I know, sorry, I also have the Geico podcast. It's this podcast that it's a, it's a labor of love. Um, it's a podcast I do for my son where I'm going to give him advice. So my son is nine years old. He thinks he knows more than me already. And so instead of trying to tell him, which I tell him all the time, things that he should know, but he doesn't, I know he's not listening to me. So I just keep talking. But this podcast is a way for me to tell him things and to have other people tell them things about things they've learned. So Harry, you've been on my podcast and other folks as well have been on my podcast and they've told really, really awesome advice. So it comes out monthly, but we do have a weekly best of that's coming out every week uh, with kind of the best of advice from me and some of my guests. So what do you do in your free time? Oh, wait, you don't have free time. <laughs> Yeah, my free time is my child. Um, so yeah, I, I just I drive him around, watch him do things, get back in the car, drive him around, get home, make dinner, and then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for being um, for being on Worldsmiths with uh, with us. We really appreciate it, and uh, what a cool publication! And Outland is honored to be able to to be a part of it, and so we thank you for that. Um, Thank you for having me on this. And definitely, I'm I'm super excited for for Yaska to get out there and for people to read um, and find out more about his story. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, you have a great day and go take care of your kid. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.